Once again, we have the opportunity to be assembled with those of like precious faith, to give honor to our Savior, and to receive a word of exhortation from the inspired word of truth. Very thankful for the work that our brother Trevor has been doing for us this weekend. I uh, want to emphasize again that uh, we really uh, put quite a load on him on a very short notice. Uh, so uh, he had uh, five lessons to prepare on. Uh, oh, this is, no, that is, that's the wrong setup here. Do I have the wrong PowerPoint up? Trevor was uh, given uh, quite a, a bit of an assignment on a short notice, which he readily accepted, and we're very thankful for that. And with uh, my experience, several years having a full-time secular job and a full-time preaching ministry, I'm very familiar with uh, a lot of late nights trying to get messages ready for the next day, or a lot of very early mornings getting messages ready uh, before I hop in the car. Uh, so, I know that Trevor's been uh, you know, working, uh, even while he's here, finishing out uh, messages that he's presenting to us. Uh, and, and that is not a criticism by any means. That's a sign of dedication. And we are very grateful uh, that he was willing to accept uh, this work this weekend. Uh, and we're thankful for his family and the congregation in the city that have been uh, accommodating uh, to allow him to come here. We appreciate that very, very much. Appreciate Doug being here as well. But we do commend to you all these lessons, and not just because of uh, the haste with which they were prepared, uh, but because of the quality of the content. Uh, Trevor has been giving us the Word of God, and he's been presenting it with conviction uh, and with knowledge, and in a way that is helpful and applicable. And so we commend to you every message that we've heard so far, and remind you that these have been live streamed on Facebook, so uh, if you're on that platform, uh, they should be very uh, accessible. And if you're not, uh, we are uploading them to YouTube as well. Uh, Friday night's message should be on YouTube by now. Uh, it was still uploading when I walked away from the office computer Saturday night. Uh, I trust it's there now, and if not, it will be soon. But uh, so will all the rest of the messages, Lord willing. Uh, we want you to have the opportunity to not only review those messages, but also to share them with others. Uh, so go find those links and, and uh, put on your own social media so others can find them. He's done a good job. I really did appreciate this morning's message in particular. It was uh, very well said. Uh, and again, the content uh, being what's most important. So we're grateful for that. Uh, looking forward to on the Gospel versus Division here in a few minutes. Uh, first, Randy will be leading us in prayer. At the end of the assembly today, Justin uh, will be dismissing us in prayer. And of course, once again, we have uh, Doug Abney leading our songs for us today. We thank you for his uh, participation with us this weekend. So at this time, uh, let's go to our God in prayer. Please pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for another beautiful day that you've allowed us to wake up and come together to study your word. Lord, we thank you for guiding Trevor through four days of spreading your word and teaching your word, and we hope and pray that we can walk away here edified together and, and pass those messages on to others. We pray for Alton Bailey, Lord, and we hope that he can get back to health and continue your work, and we pray for his family as they can help and encourage him to get to where he needs to be. Lord, we also pray for Matthew, a safe return home, and we pray for his his family. Uh, we hope that they get back to full health also. And Lord, please watch over Steve and Amber as, as they travel back to us. Lord, we're so thankful for you sacrificing your only begotten Son on this cross for, for our sins. We're so grateful for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Song number 190. Come we that love the Lord. 
Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let your strangers ring. Glory in the highest light will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God.
this point we'll continue and wrap up our discussion uh, on the gospel and the way that the gospel tells us to deal with this life. Uh, we started with just looking at the gospel itself on Friday night, uh, and we considered that the gospel, we remembered together that the gospel is the best news available, uh, because it's not just about a good thing, a favorable thing that has happened, that we get to talk about. It's about something that changes drastically our course of life in this world. Uh, part of that change, and maybe the greatest realization of that change that we can experience mm -hmm. on this earth, uh, is the unity that we can have uh, with others who are like us, standing on the promises of God. Uh, and so when we turn our attention uh, at the close of the series uh, to what the gospel says, we know that it confronts division uh, as much as it confronts any other sin. Uh, division, as we'll see in a moment, is a work of the flesh. It is the product of human wisdom. It is a product of human error. It is a product of pride. It is a product of the flesh. And it is only in the Spirit of God that we have hope for unity. And so with that, we need to be very careful, to be very faithful with that unity, and as we'll see the instruction also, to preserve the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Uh, so as we go through this lesson uh, this afternoon, we want to pay attention to those things, to uh, the effect that uh, division has, uh, and to the effect that unity has inversely. And to how much it glorifies God, coming back one more time at least, uh, to the theme of our creation being for the purpose of relationships. Our relationship with God is considered the ministry of reconciliation that Paul brings to the, the Corinthians in his second letter. Uh, and he says, I'm not just bringing this to you, but this is what we are bringing to the world, is the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, the idea that we can be united and in a relationship once more with our Father. Uh, and in a relationship of pure peace and unity, uh, we're striving for that pure peace and that pure unity in the body as we get to experience its reflection here on this earth in the kingdom of God. Uh, and so when we look at these things uh, together tonight, we remember that. Uh, starting, as always, with what the gospel says about division. And we're going to look at it kind of in two ways um, because it, it's kind of talked about in two ways, or at least we need to understand uh, the context and the way that it's being said uh, as, we, as we look at these things. So first of all, as a state of the church, as a, as a condition, uh, it's spoken out against consistently. Uh, Paul says there should not be divisions among us. There should be no divisions among us. He says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 10. That tells us that it's, it's pretty early on in his letter. He's barely wrapped up his greeting to the church in Corinth when he starts talking about the need for unity and the need to drive out division. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 10, we'll read verses 10 through 13. By inspiration of the Spirit, Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers... By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Uh, in beginning to rebuke the, the church in Corinth for the divisions that exist, and I'll make a disclaimer regarding that division here in a moment, uh, but he says it, it shouldn't be there. There should be no divisions among us. The state of the church being uh, the assembly of the saints, those who are called out by God, who are sanctified by God, who are given a purpose by God, who are united in one body of God's, We should not be divided. There should be no division among us. 
Um, because the Lord's anointed, reflecting the, the translation of the, the word Christ, uh, the Lord's anointed is not divided. He asked that question rhetorically there in verse 13, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 13. Is Christ divided? The answer to that rhetorical question is an obvious and resounding no. There is one body. There is one body. And so we need to be united and we need to make sure that that's reflected. Uh, we'll also consider what he wrote uh, several chapters later in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12 and verse 25. Uh, he's writing these things, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. So looking at this one body of Christ, uh, and I'll take this opportunity to remind us that it is one body of Christ, and we are members of that body. We're not members of the Vegas Church. We're not members of the Rapid City Church. We are members of the body of Christ, first and foremost. Uh, and that's the plan of God, is that we are united in that body. And so as a state of the, of the church, as a condition that the church is found in, uh, there ought to be no division. There ought to be no division. Uh, the disclaimer uh, that I'll give along with this is that if we look carefully in chapter 11, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he comes to a point where he says that, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it, and there must be factions among you, that those who are genuine uh, can be recognized. Uh, and so we understand when we say that there should be no division in Christ, it is because we should all be united uh, in understanding the will of the Lord. We should all be united in standing on the promises of God only. Uh, and for that reason, there should be no division. When people step away from the promises of God that we ought to be standing in, uh, then that is where division needs to come in. I realize I didn't give you the verse reference uh, for that verse in chapter 11, uh, and that's because it wasn't in my notes. Um, it's around 26 or 27. 18. It's, what's that? 18. 18, that's what I said. I need that lesson on the seat again, sorry. Um, yeah, when you come together, there's divisions, and I part I believe it. Um, verse 19, there must be factions among you that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. That is the approved Situation and condition in which there is division. But once that division occurs, we're recognizing who is in the body and who is not. This is not a divided body. This is amputating dead members of the body. It's an extreme way to put it. But it's the way that the, the gospel talks about division, and we need to understand that and speak uh, in the same way. Um. Also, and on the more personal, we also see the gospel condemn division or divisiveness as a behavior, as a sin, as a tendency of an individual. And this is what leads to the state of the congregation. We look first at that and know that there ought to be no division in the body of Christ. Uh, but we also have to know that that starts with individuals allowing the flesh uh, to work in them to the destruction, to the damage uh, of the body of Christ. Uh, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19 through 21, this is a passage we read, I think, yesterday. Galatians 5 verses 19 through 21 this is a passage we looked at to deal with confronting through the gospel sexual immorality. Also listed in here is divisions. Uh, he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Galatians 5 beginning in 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We have to understand, brethren, that division, first of all, in and of itself, being divisive is a sin that is listed in here with all of these other atrocities that we recognize and abstain from and have no question about. A divisive spirit or a divisive attitude, a divisive uh, practice is not to be tolerated in the Lord's church. We see that uh, reinforced uh, in other passages we'll look at. Uh, but one more descriptive passage 
is Jude, uh, I almost said chapters, uh, but Jude verses 17 through 19. In Jude's letter, verses 17 through 19, it is written, You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time, There will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. We have an important description listed here. When it says that these are those who cause divisions, the initial description in the warning from the apostles and the predictions of the apostles of our Lord, uh, they said in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions, re reinforcing what Paul stated in Galatians 5, that divisiveness is a work of the flesh. It is a work of the flesh. What we start to understand, especially as we consider how he describes divisive people in verse 19, is that as worldly people devoid of the Spirit. It's a reflection of the fact that they are acting without the Spirit of God. Uh, whether this is a brother who is ignoring or resisting the Spirit of God, or somebody in the world who has not yet put on Christ, who has a divisive tendency and a divisive nature, uh, it is because they're pursuing the flesh. They're following their own ungodly passions. I think it's a good... Uh, use of time to think through reasons for divisive behavior. I think we all probably know some divisive people in our lives, and we've seen the, the effect that that's had on the, the families that they're in, on the situations around them, on the churches that they've affected, the congregations that they've affected and divided in many cases, or tried to in others. We can look and see what's going on in their life, maybe specifically, probably generically, uh, that kind of person might have uh, experienced nothing in their own life but division. And so it might be all they know, and they're living that out because they're the product of division, and they're going to produce more division. Uh, there's a, an expression that hurt people hurt people. And it's not a chant. It's a, it's a statement that those who have been hurt have a tendency to continue to hurt others. Uh, and so we, we understand that there are many reasons that this might come to be, that there are many things that can be brought into play that affect and that influence a certain person's um, pattern of behavior, just like pride is one of them. Uh, that exercise, I say, is worthwhile because it, first of all, helps us find godly compassion uh, towards them, uh, the kind that Jesus would have displayed as well, but also um, because... Uh, that can help us to confront it in an appropriate and meaningful way, uh, as we ought to do, when we understand that a little bit better. At any case, whatever the reasoning is, whether it's the fact that they're a product of division, maybe it's a fact that they can't control or don't feel like they can control the factors going wrong in their own lives and they need to control others and make others' lives miserable as a result, a plethora of reasons that people uh, dis display divisive behavior and attitudes, whatever those things are, those are works of the flesh. They are products of the flesh. There are people who are in Christ who have had those same things happen to them, who have had those same experiences, who have those same backgrounds and that same trauma and that same excuse, but because they, sub they have emptied themselves and submitted to the Spirit of God, and as they're walking in the Spirit, they do not force that division on others. Uh, and so when we, when we look at that behavior, we need to recognize it's acting out of unity. It's acting devoid of the Spirit. Uh, looking at Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, and then we'll look at one more uh, verse that tells us how to, uh, how to treat or regard... Uh, divisive people. Romans 16, verse 17. Paul writes that I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. Avoid them. The gospel tells us to avoid divisive people. That's Romans 16 and verse 17. We're going to move kind of quickly to Titus chapter 3. Verses 10 and 11. Titus 
would have done well to, to reverse these in order. Uh, but at any rate, Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. As for a person who stirs up division, after war warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. We understand this is to line up with the steps prescribed, the disciplinary steps prescribed in Matthew chapter 18, uh, of coming to somebody, warning them in love to turn from the error of their ways. And if at any point, either after the first or the second warning, uh, they repent, you have won your brother or your sister. But when they continue in their division and in their divisiveness, uh, we are to... Turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because it's that flesh uh, that needs to be destroyed. It's that flesh that is causing this behavior, as we saw, to mention that once again. Uh, when it says that such a person is warped, I can't help but think that ties into the, the sub-theme we've noticed of sanctification being instruments, being vessels dedicated and devoted to the use of God uh, and use in God's kingdom, use by God. When we've taken what is made holy and what is set apart for a specific purpose and formed in a specific way, and then it, it becomes warped. It is no longer the image that God designed or intended for it to take. Uh, we need to understand, brethren, that division, divisiveness, is really and explicitly condemned. And that in and of itself is a kind of good news when we think about it for a minute because we think about now a, an aspect of our life in this broken world where division is not encouraged in any way. There is an aspect of our life in this world where unity is explicitly commanded, prescribed, and to be striven for by the collective whole. That doesn't exist in the world. That doesn't exist in the world. Whether we're talking about politics, sure, we want everybody to think like us and vote like us and live like us, but we know that that's not going to be the case, and so division is in its own way promoted. Uh, whether you want to look at, at leisure activities and, and sports teams and how fun it is to have rivalries and things like that, um, every facet of human existence embodies division. In some cases, in applications to more harm or detriment than others. But it's a fact of this world. It's only in Christ, it's only through the gospel, that division is condemned. Which already indicates, and inherently indicates, that there is an alternative. There's an alternative to the division, to the fractured state uh, of the world that we live in. Oops, controlling the wrong thing. And so when we look for hope to share with those who are divided or divisive, uh, just as when we look at the gospel against deceit, we see its prescriptions and hope for the deceived as well as the deceivers. Uh, so in the same way, we see hope for those who are affected negatively by division, which is all of mankind. Uh, and we see hope for those who are divisive. Uh, in the gospel. And so first of all, let's look at Ephesians. We're going to look at chapter 2 and then a passage in chapter 3 and then a passage in chapter 4. We're going to do a mini study on the, the middle of Ephesians here for a moment. Uh, first in chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 13 through 18. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. You're into highlighting or underlining or drawing circles and connecting dots in your, in your Bible. That's a, 
great passage to look through. All of chapter 2 really is a good passage to look through and go through uh, the phrases that talk about unity. Because the word unity uh, doesn't occur in that passage, and yet that passage is all about unity. Those who are far off, brought near by the blood of Christ. He is our peace, made us both one. He's broken down the dividing wall, so on and so forth. Uh, the hope that that brings, I think, is obvious, uh, but is stated as you see on the slide that he's made us one. He's broke down the dividing wall, and he has reconciled us uh, to God in his body, uh, as we see in verse 16. And so the, the hope there, just as much as the, the message of the gospel against division and divisiveness infers an opposite, infers another option, infers that there is an alternative to the division that's so rampant in the world. Uh, the very message and the very existence of the church shows the reality of that and God's design for that reality of unity to be expressed and to be seen in this world. Unity isn't something that I have to wait for. When I put on Christ, I don't have to wait for some point in time. I certainly don't have to wait until Judgment Day to see unity. I need to wait that long to see it perfected. I need to wait that long to truly, in both a physical and a uh, spiritual sense, see it realized. Uh, as we'll be both in the presence of God and we'll be fully united with Him uh, in all thought and all knowledge and in all things. Uh, we'll see that fully in heaven, uh, but we can also see an expression of that now, and even an expression of that, even a small, small form of that is precious and hope-giving. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, Paul writes, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to, be, to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of the Lord's anointed, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Through the gospel, we see the hope uh, that is the reality of the, the mystery of Christ. And he's using that language uh, mostly throughout Ephesians, uh, sometimes in other of his letters, appealing to the, the reality of, of mystery religions and mystery cults that were prevalent in Ephesus and other cities like Ephesus, uh, where you would become ingrained in these, in these cults so that you could at, get, at best get to some certain level where you would unlock the secret of the universe. It, at some point you would be entrusted with the great secret of all things and they keep you coming and they keep you coming and you work your way up the ladder until you get to hear this very, very secret revelation, this mystery that this whole entire cult is based off of. Paul plays on that in the world and he brings that language into how he's teaching uh, the Christians who are in those areas and who have probably many of them come out of those mystery cults in that dynamic. And he's saying, you want to know a mystery? You want to know the mystery of the universe? You want to know the mystery of God's plan and all creation? I'll tell it to you at level one. I'll tell it to you before you even come in the doors. I'll give you this hope. This is the mystery of all things. It's not just the Israelites who are saved. It's, it's, it's not a matter of nationality. It's not a matter of physical things. It's not a matter of where you were born or who you were born to or, or what you were taught. It's a matter of what you come to and how you come to God through Christ. And in that, that mystery, that great truth, that great revelation, is that promise, that hope of unity being a reality we can experience part of on this earth. We ought to treat it like it's that precious. That's the, that's the very design and intention 
of God's body as a whole is to be an expression of that unity. Let's look in the next chapter, uh, chapter 4. Uh, of course, we see in verse 3 um, that we should be... Um, well, let's read verses 1 through uh, 6 for now, and then we'll, we'll come back to some more of that. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You don't have to maintain something you don't have yet. You don't have to maintain a car that isn't yours. Usually, unless you work at a dealership. Uh, the idea of maintenance being included here tells us we have that. We have the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Let's keep reading through verse 6. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Uh, unity is expressly our purpose and something we are striving to maintain. And it does take striving, but we'll get to that more in the faithfulness section. As we continue reading, uh, and we can go ahead and jump down to verse 11. Uh, Ephesians 4 verse 11 talks about the construction of the church. He talks about the design of the church and the intention of that design. Uh, in verse 11, uh, he talks about the different roles that he gave in uh, he says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain, there's a goal here in mind, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love. And we'll look at that uh, later. So when God constructed this idea. When he set forth this plan. Before the foundation of the world. For Christ's body to be realized. And to be the reality of how his kingdom would be expressed on this earth. The point of it. Was that there would be mutual uplifting of building and edification to the effect that we would all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now I want to make something really clear. Uh, that mature manhood, that uh, full stature of the fullness of Christ is the body's mission. That is the body's mission. I want life to the mission, the instruction, and the pattern of Jesus. Don't misunderstand. But that won't be realized uh, in one member. One member of a body cannot do the role and the uh, mission and accomplish the mission uh, of the entire body. Uh, and so when we look at the, the life that Christ lived, when we look at the example and the pattern that he set forth, uh, I am bound to that and I am imitating him in every way but I need to understand that my role, my expectation is a facet of Christ's life so that by me doing and producing what every joint ought to supply what every member ought to supply to the body as a whole works toward the effect that the whole body the whole body which Hebrews 11 uh, the first few verses calls uh, the great or says includes the great cloud of witnesses, right? So all of those who are in Christ, uh, all of those throughout all of time who have been submitting to God and walking with God, all of us as a collective body grow to attain the unity uh, of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, which are manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When we're pursuing that as a body, in unison, uh, as members, being edified, being built up, 
growing with the body around us, being nourished by the body around us and nourishing the body around us. It will have the effect of individual maturity, as he says in verse 14, no longer being children, tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Uh, but we understand there's a, there's a body mission and purpose, and there's an individual reality as a result. That's part of God's design uh, for his body, is to be an expression of the reality of his unity. That's not something that's going to be completely fulfilled until the final day. Uh, but that is something we are collectively part of working towards. Uh, and something that we get to, as we work towards that, experience small, uh, small versions of the unity that exists in the body as a whole. Uh, as we talk about this, uh, we do well to understand not just the concept and not just the hope of the concept. The hope, uh, to restate it one last time uh, for now, uh, the hope of unity is that in contrast to a broken and divided world, we can be brought into a body where there is cooperation and there is unity and there is peace in a way that the world can never know outside of that. And so as we share the gospel of unity uh, and the gospel against division, we share that hope along with it. Uh, but we need to understand what that unity looks like. What does it look like to be of one mind with one another? What does it mean to agree with one another in some of the ways that Paul writes about and the, the gospel as a whole talks about? Uh, what is that oneness? Does that mean that there can be no uh, division of Broncos fans versus Raiders fans? Uh, and I realize I'm in Raider country all of a sudden. I didn't used to be when I came here. I'm not used to that. Uh, you know, does it mean that we can't have different favorite teams or prefer Star Trek over Star Wars? I won't say which one is correct, um, but it's Star Wars. Um, is that the kind of unity that's being prescribed? Is it talking about that kind of oneness? Does it talk about that kind of one-mindedness that, that we can't disagree on anything? Obviously not, and obviously not just on the silly things of the flesh, like sports teams and superior elements of sci-fi, right? Uh, it's not just talking about those things. It's talking even about spiritual things, or things that run right up against that spiritual line. That's why we have passages like 1 Corinthians 8 and 10. And that's why we have passages like Romans 14 that tell us we're going to need to work out how to exist with each other and how to express this unity and this peace that we have uniquely uh, in Christ, even though we disagree over whether or not you can eat meat sacrificed to idols. We have uh, at least three instances in which this kind of oneness is described. And the ultimate, the most perfect uh, form of that unity, that oneness, is God. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6, this is the Shema. And it's called the Shema um, because that's the first Hebrew word. And it's a word that means hear or listen. means understand. Uh, this is what uh, Jews even today, daily repeat among themselves to remind them and to make sure that they collectively understand and never lose the understanding of this divine truth. 6 verse 4, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. In telling us this, and there's a lot I'd like to look at in just those three verses even, um, especially chapter 5, reinforcing the point of our purpose being relationships first and foremost with God. That's why Jesus calls that the greatest command, is to love the Lord our God with all of our being. Another fun thing to point out is the word might is not actually the word might in Hebrew. It's the word very or much. Make that make sense in English. Uh, love the Lord your God with all of your muchness, with all of your very. Uh, it's a very intentional word choice and a fascinating one, but uh, I'll let you ponder that later. The point, obviously, is talking about the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We understand that the 
Godhead, as it's sometimes termed, consists of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to give you a full disambiguation and breakdown and theological uh, perspective on uh, what's called the Trinity in many circles. Uh, but what I am going to point out to you is that the way and the, the meaning of them being one is that they are completely and perfectly, harmoniously united in will, in purpose, and in power in authority, in strength, in capability, and ability. Everything about them, all of their attributes are united and they have in the same measure. The same measure. Uh, and so when it says that the Lord our God is one, and when Jesus says in John 10 and verse 30, for example, I and the Father are one, that's what he's expressing. He's not expressing we're the exact same person. We're just taking different shapes depending on what the world needs at the time. Uh, he is saying we are so united in purpose and in will and in power that it is as though there is no distinction. We are one. That is the same oneness prescribed and actually just flat out described in Mark 10, verses 7 through 9, quoting from Genesis 2 and verse 24. Um, but Jesus, in giving a discourse on uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, actually, says that because of this, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. That's Mark 10, 7 through 9. And so when we, when we look at that idea, we look at the reality of what a marriage is, when it says that they shall become one flesh. We know that when a couple gets married, they do not just absorb into one slightly larger body. Uh, that is obviously not what it means, and yet that's the language that's given. What it actually means, and in the, in the Hebrew in Genesis 2... There's a word that's used there for joined together that doesn't, that's not talking about glue. It's not talking about um, a, a lever wrapped around a, 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 an inclined plane or, or an inclined plane wrapped around a, a lever. How do you describe a screw? I don't remember now. Um, it's not talking about any kind of wood fastener or staple or, or anything like that. It's talking about the kind of, of joined together that means that there is nothing in between them anymore. It's best described when, if you've ever taken two planes of glass and you've pressed them together, you can feel as the air sucks out of between the planes of glass and try as you might, you can't separate them. You can't pull them apart. That is now one piece of glass for all intents and purposes. You can see a division, but it's acting as one. And the only way to separate that is to introduce air in between. There's a great spiritual application there. Division even in the church is a matter of sin and the flesh being brought in between and being introduced uh, into our relationships and into our relationship with God. That's where division occurs. Otherwise, our unity, our oneness, is a matter of being individual members with no thing between us. Nothing separating us anymore because Christ broke down in his flesh, the dividing wall. That's how it's described especially in regards to the marriage relationship. Um, but it's also how we need to understand our relationship with one another. It should be that way. Uh, looking back at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, we could look at this whole chapter. We could look at the whole letter to the Ephesians. We could look at, well, the, the whole New Testament, it seems, is largely centered around our relationships with each other and with God, as it turns out, since that's the point of the gospel is reconciliation and unity. And so when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, it's no surprise to find that same theme expressed in these words, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all immersed into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the, de for the body does not consist of one member, but many. Being of one mind and perfectly one with each other does not mean that we are all the same big toe. 
It means that though I'm a big toe and you're somewhere in the, the humerus, I fancy myself the humerus, I think I'm funny. Um, even though we're on opposite ends of the body, we are still one with each other. Because all that's in between you and me is more of the body. That's it. That's the only uh, space in between each other. Faithfulness with unity needs to reflect that. And so when we see instructions to pursue peace, like we see in Romans chapter uh, 16, we saw the warning against uh, the divisive people in verse 17. I'm sorry, I want chapter 14. Uh, we did look at 16, 7, 16 verse 17 earlier. Um, but in Romans chapter 14, in talking about uh, that issue of, of judgment and of the things that we are okay with disagreeing about, uh, he tells us in that context to pursue peace with one another uh, and the things that make up for uh, edification. Uh, and that's verse 19. Romans 14, verse 19. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That's our commission with the gospel against the It's not just something that we get to be perfectly united and understand and, and come to a sense of full unity and peace in heaven. It's a matter of we get to experience a transition, a transformation from inherently divided and divisive to inherently united, and we have to give opportunity for the flesh for division to creep into the church. Uh, we get to experience the reality of unity in a small form now in the body of Christ. But it's not easy. Just like any of these other things that we have to be faithful with are not easy. They don't come naturally because we are still caring about the flesh. And so in the flesh, we are still caring about the deeds of the flesh, the work of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, following the lusts of the flesh from time to time. And so it's a constant and continued effort for us to put away and put aside the flesh and allow the Spirit to live in us and work in us and to be submitting to God. And so just as that's true for any desires for sexual immorality or deceit or any other sin that we look at, whether we've looked at, the, at them this weekend or not, it is always true that what we're entrusted with, what we're given as an alternative to the broken world uh, that we came from, we have to pursue it. We have to intentionally put away the things of the flesh and pursue uh, that peace and unity. And I think the most intentional uh, way that we can do that and a most biblical way to pursue that unity is by practicing the same forgiveness that we've received from God. Because the fact is that we are going to wrong each other. We are going to hurt each other. Usually it's going to be on accident. How we respond to that needs to reflect our God. The only reason that we have unity with Him is not because we became perfect and stopped sinning. It's because when we put on Christ in baptism... He stopped seeing our sin and started, see, started seeing instead the righteousness of His Son. That's what that reconciliation looks like. It's the reflection, it's the reality of our forgiveness. And so if we want to have unity with each other, if we want to have unity with other Christians, we need to be very quick to forgive them. Because it's in the same way that we forgive others that we'll be forgiven by God. And so we need to always, always remember that uh, as often as we've been wronged and as often as we uh, see wrong being done or having been done. That forgiveness is the beauty of Christ. We can look at the, the beauty of Christ that ought to be seen in us, and we see that in every way. We see, and just as we mentioned, uh, as was mentioned earlier, 
the, the point of the whole body is to reach the fullness of the maturity of Christ. The point of the whole body is to work towards that. The whole body, it will take the whole body of believers throughout all of time and all of space to exhibit the fullness of Christ. Um, but one thing that you and I can control is ourselves, and we can control how in every way we respond to those who harm us, who bring injury upon uh, ourselves and on Christ's body. Um, and we can, we can choose to have a forgiving spirit in nature. Uh, that's what it is to be a peacemaker, as is commanded in uh, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, that's what it is to pursue peace and to be eager to maintain the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. And so let's be forgiving people. And if we can uh, help you with that or pray for you in any way, uh, let us know as we stand and sing. Please do pass them on to others. Uh, Trevor, uh, we thank you for your good work. And uh, we send you home with greetings from the Vegas Valley Church of Christ to all the faithful saints in Rapid City. Uh, and we know that next weekend you'll be preaching in Maryland as well. Uh, we solemnly charge you to greet them in our name as well. Please. And Doug, we send you home with the same responsibility. Please greet the faithful brethren in Phoenix from this congregation, and uh, don't forget to do the same when you get to Oklahoma uh, later in the year, uh, and say hi to your parents for us. So uh, we thank uh, these brothers who uh, come here to bless us this weekend, and we indeed have been blessed. We were blessed when our brother Colby Junkin uh, introduced us to Alton Bailey, and we were blessed when our brother Alton Bailey offered to come here at no expense to this congregation, knowing our limited resources, uh, to provide edification for us this weekend. Uh, we are praying for uh, his recovery, of course. Uh, he did message today, so it sounds like he's doing well, and we're thankful for that. Uh, we were blessed when uh, Trevor didn't hesitate uh, to accept this responsibility on very short notice, and we were blessed to have uh, Doug accept the responsibility of coming up as well. Uh, he cut his work day in half on Friday, to be able to be with us Friday night. Uh, we understand that that is a sacrifice, and we uh, do appreciate it. And we appreciate the sacrifice uh, of uh, those in Trevor's household and the congregation there uh, who accepted uh, different responsibilities while he was away. So uh, we have been very blessed uh, this weekend, and we should not forget it, uh, particularly in view of the fact that this congregation very, very, very seldom has gospel meetings. Uh, 
from time to time uh, when a brother I know who's a preacher or who likes to preach uh, is stopping in on a Sunday or Wednesday, we will impose upon them uh, to impart to us uh, some portion of the Word of Truth. Uh, but usually uh, scheduled meetings uh, with more than one uh, message are uh, very, very rare indeed. In fact, I can think of only two of those uh, since this congregation was planted in 2007. Uh, so to be able to have uh, this opportunity has been great. We're looking forward to the messages from our brother Jeff uh, later in the fall this year. Uh, so uh, let's give God thanks for all those things and uh, send our brothers uh, on their way uh, with God's speed. At this time, we will be dismissed in prayer. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you before we depart this place to give thanks. We have a lot to be thankful for. We thank you for the brothers and sisters that took the time and the love to put this meeting together. We thank you for the many messages that were delivered. We pray that these messages struck people in a way that they needed in their lives right now. We pray that the members here will take the time and the love and the care to spread those messages amongst the community. We pray that you'll be with those that are traveling. We pray that you'll be with Trevor and Doug as they go back home. We pray that you'll be with uh, those of this congregation that are traveling as well. We pray that you'll watch over us and protect us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.